We'll start with Mr. Brock uh, for six minutes, please. Go ahead, Mr. Brock. Thank you, Chair. And I'd like to welcome uh, both Professor Clark and Mr. Boots uh, to the Government Operations Committee, also known as the Mighty Ogo. So I'd like to frame my first round of questions to you that it's, it's basically guided by two news articles that I was able to research. One from the um, uh, National Post, written by Christopher Nardi, which I understand resulted in an interview between Mr. Nardi and both uh, you, Ms. Clark, and Mr. Boots, as well as a policy option piece that both of you authored, dated February 16, 2024. But I guess I'll start by making an obvious assumption that the arrive can scam, debacle, however you want to frame it, certainly didn't come as a surprise to you, to you, Ms. Clark, Professor Clark, and to you, Mr. Boots. Would that be a fair statement to make? Yeah, we, I think that was sort of the premise of the policy options article, was that this is something we should anticipate. Right. And we all know what the Auditor General had to say about the whole situation. It was a clear picture of mismanagement around the app. She's guessing at the cost of the app, which we believe to be just shy of $60 million, could be much higher. But we don't have the proper documentation. The departments were so rushed and hurried to put together the app, they did not retain proper documentation. And I guess uh, to you, Professor, and to you, Mr. Boots, that brought to mind the challenges of improper documentation that you found in your 2022 research paper. So the first question I put to you is, um, this is based on the uh, policy options piece. You said that what could be done with respect to these findings? A response from the government uh, is to simply add more rules, more oversight mechanisms, and more internal processes to prevent scandals. But following this age-old pattern will ensure that failures like ARRIVE-CAN and its, scan its IT scandal predecessor, Phoenix, continue. Can you elaborate on that for me, please? Yeah, and, and this echoes a lot of what Mr. Boots offered in his opening remarks. Um, there has been a tendency, I think, historically in the Government of Canada to layer on more rules and oversight to create new parliamentary officers, new um, kind of external scrutineers, um, when there's some sort of a scandal. Um, and while, of course, like, we're clearly not advocating for, for no rules, and in fact, you know, the research in, in clean, high-quality IT procurement focuses a lot on, like, what the guardrails should be and building a culture of responsible public service around that to avoid things like conflict of interest, for example. Um, but I think that habit that we've had in Canadian public administration to layer on more rules as a way of ensuring accountability has actually had this perverse effect of undermining accountability and seriously undermining the effectiveness of public servants. So there's, you know, tons of examples that you can find, uh, you know, a classic one that people love to talk about uh, maybe 10 years ago was when the federal government first started using social media and there were, you know, so in some cases, these 20-step approval processes to release a 140-character tweet. Um, you can also uh, look to um, the Federal Field Notes website written by Paul Craig that uh, Mr. Boots referenced to find some great examples of this sort of internal administrative burden. Um, in one case, documentation required to publish a five-page uh, website basically was like had more words than the entire uh, edition of The Great Gatsby. So, like we mire public servants and so much rules and compliance and the reporting burden, which is which is really well documented, not just in IT but but across the study of Canadian governance. Um, and so it, it has two effects uh, that are relevant to this question of IT contracting. Um, one is it means when it makes sense to build in house and to try to adopt kind of modern um, service design practices like user research, agile, uh, multi disciplinary teams, public servants actually can't. It's like really difficult to do the right thing. We, we add so many rules that they can't be sort of nimble enough. So streamlining those rules would, I think, create space for public servants to do some more of this work internally. Um, but the second piece of it is that when you have those rules in place, um, it actually becomes difficult for vendors in some cases to work in modern ways with, um, with the federal public service because there are tight rules around things like project gating or the way that money flows um, because they can't pull together a multidisciplinary team of internal public servants because HR rules don't allow it. So that's why I think the focus on kind of this latest 
f spotlight on the problems of IT contracting should meaningfully lead to, like, a reset of policy um, with a focus on kind of enabling good public service and, and focusing on what matters, which is, like, the conflict of interest and the, you know, responsible bidding processes, um, not creating documentation burdens for public servants. That's not going to help. In fact, it'll make it worse. Thank you for that thorough if response. Can... Mr. Boots, do you have anything to add? Yeah, if I could just build on Professor Clark's remarks, I think the 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 pattern that you see in a lot of public sector IT work is if you imagine a large project that has 100 public servants working on it, 90 of them will be writing Word documents that are, you know, project management, oversight compliance reports, all sorts of things that are not actually building the software. If you've got 100 people and only maybe five of them are actually writing software code, configuring systems, that's a real, that's a really odd ratio that is very normal in public sector IT and just completely foreign if you worked at Shopify or Google or another mature tech company. And so trying to reduce those barriers that public servants face with oversight and compliance mechanisms that are really outdated means that you could spend less money having 90 people write meaningless Word documents and having more people actually build software code. And I think one of the, one of the sort of understated scandals of public sector IT is that it's very, very normal for the public service to undertake a uh, $100 million IT project that could have been done for $10 million or a $30 million IT project that could have been done for $2 million. And so this, this expectation that it's normal to have a $50 million IT project to build you know, an online forum or an interactive website that could have been done for a fraction of the cost. And there's some really great writing from Waldo Jaquith, who is a technologist in the United States, that talks about how software is so much cheaper, it's not free, but it's much, much cheaper than public sector organizations expect. But the tendency is to say, oh yeah, this project that's, you know, is kind of similar to this previous project our department did. The last one was $50 million. So this one's probably 50 or $60 million when a really strong team could have built it for $2 million. And that's something that is, is tricky to sort of dig into because it all has to do with how, how public servants are doing the work of IT projects where, 90 out of 100 yeah. people are just writing Mr. Word Boots? documents instead of actually yeah. building. I'm afraid I have to interrupt you because uh, we're past our time.